Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History. We're hitting you up with another presidential election. This time it's 1832, the re-election of King Andrew. That's right, Andrew Jackson's gonna stick around for another four years, but not without some drama and bumps along the road in that presidential election. So let's take a look at the issues. Let's take a look at the parties. Let's take a look at the results. Take a look at the giddy up for the learning. Let's get started right now. So let's first talk about the third party, which is actually going to win a state. The Anti-Masons, they're going to win Vermont. How about that? The Anti-Masons really originate in western New York, actually in kind of a conspiracy, really weird story that occurs in Batavia with the disappearance of a man by the name of William Morgan. William Morgan was a Mason himself. Um, Masons are seen as anti-Masons as being kind of a secret society that's controlling the United States and going against everything the Republic stands for, a coalition of uh, Illuminati, in a sense. But he was a Freemason in Canada. He came to Rochester, where he was in a lodge. And then William Morgan ends up in Batavia, tries to get into the secret society there. And they don't want him. They're like, go away, William Morgan. We don't want you. So William Morgan's all like, well, I'm going to write a book and tell all your secrets. The next thing you know, the printer, the publisher's uh, place burns down. William Morgan is arrested on trumped up charges. And the next thing you know, the man disappears. And then there's this kind of conspiracy that's wrapped around uh, his disappearance, and that's how the Anti-Masons begin their journey to being a third party. They eventually hope to kind of connect themselves with the National Republicans, but we're going to find out down the road that Henry Clay, who's a Freemason himself, like Andrew Jackson, is going to refuse to denounce the Freemasons, and the Anti-Masons are going to have to stand on their own two feet. But they did have the first national convention in American history in Baltimore in 1831, and there were some serious contenders, like Richard Rush, who was on the ticket with John Quincy Adams in 1828. John Quincy Adams himself, he's like, I'll come back. I'll be the zombie man and come back and win the presidency as an anti-Mason. And the anti-Masons are like, nobody likes you. We don't want you. So they end up nominating William Wirt. William Wirt has a very interesting resume. Um, he was asked by Thomas Jefferson in 1807 to help uh, try Aaron Burr for treason. He becomes James Monroe's attorney general, really elevating that position. He stayed in it for 12 years through John Quincy Adams' administration. A serious Supreme Court prosecutor. He argued cases like uh, McCulloch versus Maryland, Gibbons versus Ogden, the Cherokee court cases, including Worcester versus Georgia, where he's arguing on behalf of the Cherokees. But William Wirt, he's going to take the nomination, really with the hopes this is going to lead to a nomination by the National Republicans. But again, he's going to end up having to stand on his own two feet. Now, we also, of course, have the National Republicans. They're going to follow suit with the convention in 1832 in Baltimore, and they're going to end up nominating our boy Henry Clay from 1824. Remember Henry Clay and the corrupt bargain, ends up throwing his support to John Quincy Adams, gets the Secretary of State position, thinks he's going to stick by John Quincy Adams and be the next president of the United States. Of course, John Quincy Adams loses in 1828, so Henry Clay is like, I'm not waiting any longer. I want to be the president of the United States. And Henry Clay um, opposes Jackson's policies on the National Bank. He believes in this American system with a strong economic hand by the federal government and in infrastructure improvements, having a high tariff policy to protect U.S. manufacturing. Manufacturers. He's going to end up getting John Sargent on his ticket as vice president from Pennsylvania, which is a very important swing state back in the day. And then we have the Democrats. The Democrats really don't need a convention. Andrew Jackson's going to be the nominee, but they're going to have a convention in Baltimore really to talk about their vice presidential nominee, who's going to end up being Martin Van Buren. So let's talk a little bit about Jackson's history with his vice president, John Calhoun, because John Calhoun's going to get kicked off the ticket. And there's a number of reasons. Some of them are political, really important reasons. Issues like the tariff. John Calhoun is fundamentally opposed to the tariff. He writes something called the Fort Hill Letter that argues that states have a right to nullify federal action if they believe it's unconstitutional. Andrew Jackson is furious. And then he's going to get even more furious when it comes to the Petticoat Affair. The Petticoat Affair really is going to break up the relationship between John Calhoun and Andrew Jackson and really break up the cabinet 
and create pandemonium inside the White House and inside Jackson administration. But John Eaton, who Andrew Jackson is going to appoint to be Secretary of War, he replaced him as a senator from Tennessee. He was really young. He was like 28 years old. But he began hanging out with this woman named Peggy, who was married to a much older man. That much older man um, was in debt. He was a drunkard. And it was said that John Eaton was helping his friend Peggy and her husband kind of get inside deals in Washington, D.C. He's helping out his friends Peggy and John Timberlake. Well, John Timberlake, this much older drunkard, ends up getting a commission, gets sent away, and dies. And then within moments, John Eaton marries Peggy with Andrew Jackson's blessing. Remember, Andrew Jackson was a widower himself. His wife died right after he was elected in 1828. So he kind of has a soft spot for widowers, I guess. Well, what ends up happening is because of Peggy's past, this new wife of John Eaton. Um, she was very well educated, but she lived in a boarding house and she met lots of different kinds of men and had lots of different uh, interactions with different social classes. Well, John Calhoun's wife, Mrs. Calhoun, does not like Peggy at all. All. She's banned, along with John Eaton, from the social circle in Washington, D.C. She's not giving invitations. She's not allowed to mingle with any of the other uh, cabinet wives. And this really creates a humongous amount of friction between John Calhoun and Andrew Jackson. What ends up happening is Andrew Jackson asks John Eaton and Martin Van Buren, a supporter of John Eaton, to step away from the cabinet. And then he asks everybody to quit the cabinet because of the dysfunction. And they all step down. And then he gets to replace them all with his closest advisors. And he also had something called the Kitchen Cabinet, which was really a small group of advisors, including Martin Van Buren, where he was getting most of his advice from. So this relationship with his vice presidency, because of the petticoat affair and what happened with John Eaton and his wife, is really going to throw John Calhoun off the ticket. And then it gets worse, because Martin Van Buren is then appointed to be minister to Great Britain, where he faces a Senate confirmation hearing, and it's a tie. And we all know what happens in a tie. The vice president gets to vote. That's John Calhoun. John Calhoun is going to say no to Martin Van Buren, and Andrew Jackson is going to be like... It ends up being that the convention that we started talking about is really about getting Martin Van Buren on the ticket. The only other kind of notable fact about that convention is they passed something called the two-thirds rule to make sure that there's unity in the Democratic Party, and that works in getting Martin Van Buren on the ticket, but it's going to be Martin Van Buren's backstabber in 1844 when he's denied the convention because of that two-thirds rule. So we have our candidates. That was a lot of talking. We have William Wirt, ding, 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 the anti-Mason. We have Andrew Jackson, our Democrat, and the National Republicans. This is their last run at it. They're, of course, going with Henry Clay from the great state of Kentucky. So let's take a look at the campaign issues and the campaign results. How about that, kids? <laughs> Andrew Jackson is going to run this campaign a little bit different this time. In his first campaign in 1828, there were a lot of writings, a lot of pamphlets, a lot of newspaper articles. But because of kind of the complexity of the National Bank and how the National Republicans are attacking him on these economic issues, Andrew Jackson kind of thinks it's better to go directly to the people. So Andrew Jackson runs a very populous campaign in 1832 with picnics and parades and fireworks and lots of kissing of babies. But he also has the benefit that the anti-Masons are running. And the anti-Masons draw their power from the National Republican Party in the North. So that's going to help Andrew Jackson really splitting the ticket between the anti-Masons and the National Republicans in a lot of states that are going to allow him to grab even more electoral votes this time around. Now, the big issue, of course, is the National Bank. The banks are throwing tons of money to the National Republicans, and Jackson is running a campaign of anti-elitism, as is the anti-Masons as well. It's really a huge barrel of of American politics that's really focusing in just like we are now at anger at the system and, and looking for an alternative. Of course, the anti-Masons are creating really great political cartoons like this one, King Andrew, where they're showing that Andrew Jackson is an elitist, that you know he's a Mason who believes in his own power as king. He's the veto king. He's standing on the Constitution. How can we have this guy? Well, we're going to get this guy again. Let's take a look at the big map. Don't you want to see the big map? I want to show you the big map. So here we go, guys. Let's take a look at our results and how the four candidates did. What are you talking about, Mr. Hughes? There's only three candidates. 
No, there's not. There's four candidates. When you look at the map, you can see that South Carolina's electoral votes are going to go to a man by the name of John Floyd. At the end of the day, they don't have a popular vote. Their state legislature is going to choose who they're going with, and they want a nullifier. They want somebody that is going to say to the federal government, no way, Jose, we're not doing this tariff business. So they're going to nominate John Floyd, who wasn't even on the ticket anywhere. Now, the anti-Masons are going to pick up seven electoral votes, picking up the great state of Vermont, but they're really going to split the vote with the National Republicans and give a lot of states, like we said, to Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson and Martin Van Buren end up with 219 electoral votes. You only needed 144 out of 286. So without a doubt, he is the dominant winner in this. And he's also picking up not only 16 states, but over 700,000 votes, which tallies up to about 54 percent of the popular vote. Now, the National Republicans, they're going to go away forever after this dismal failure. They're going to actually combine forces with the anti-Masons and turn themselves into the Whigs. How about that? The National Republican become the Whigs. But Henry Clay, poor Henry Clay, he is only going to pick up six states, Maryland, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware. And that only totals up to 49 electoral votes. He picks up about 484,000 thousand popular votes and that only tallies up to about 37.4 percent of the electorate. So Andrew Jackson, he's the dominant winner and of course he's going to be a two-term president. Congratulations Andrew Jackson and Martin Van Buren is waiting in the wings to run in 1836. So we hope you guys understand something about the election of 1832, anti-Masons and the Petticoat Affair and the National Bank and oh my goodness American history is so fun to talk about. All right guys, if you haven't checked out the election playlist. We're really coming close to finishing all of these elections. You can go down in the description below and click on that playlist and go find your favorite election, kitties. And if you haven't subscribed to Hip Hughes History, you should probably do that too because it's the right thing to do. Or just go to hiphughes.com, check out the video arsenal. We have about 280, 290 videos. I don't know anymore. All right, guys, I'm done. I'm going to say it because I always say it. Where tension goes, energy flows. And we'll see you guys next time that you press my buttons.